I am thrilled to welcome Debbie Applegate, who is the author of Madam, the biography of Polly Adler, icon, icon of the jazz age. Just a little bit about our author. Um, Debbie Applegate is a historian whose first book, The Most Famous Man in America, the biography of Henry Ward Beecher, won the 2007 Pulitzer Prize for biography and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Book Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award for biography. She's a graduate of Amherst College. She was a Sterling Fellow in American Studies at Yale University, where she received her PhD, and now she lives in New Haven. We are thrilled to welcome you, Debbie, and we can't wait to learn with you. No one wants to hear from me any longer, so I'm going to turn things right over to you. Just make sure you unmute yourself as I mute myself, and we continue with our program. Thank you for the reminder. Always good to be. I, no matter how many times I do this, I still end up somehow muted for some portion of the time. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I, it, this is really a genuine pleasure. And thank you, Rabbi Mendelssohn, for uh, hosting me. Um, it is a little bit, in, I get a, I want to start with an apology right off the bat. Uh, because you are clearly uh, people of uh, the book, people of God, uh, people, decent people. This subject is perhaps not the most decent of subjects, um, as you might might or might not have guessed by now. Um, it is true, my first book it was a very different topic. It was about a once forgot, once very, very famous, uh, now forgotten Calvinist minister named Henry Ward Beecher. Um, and in that book, it covered all the things we used to say you never talk about in polite company, uh, sex, politics, and religion. Well, but now I feel like there probably is nothing like, polit uh, like polite company. And apparently all we do in America now is talk about sex, politics, and religion. Uh, nonetheless, it was a big, big leap uh, from ministers to madams and from would-be saints to unrepentant sinners. Um, with Polly Adler, we are now entering the dark underbelly of American history. Uh, that is not how Polly would tell it. She preferred to cast herself as a modern Horatio Alger hero. Uh, as, as she once wrote, a cynical person might say that my life has been a typical American success story from my arrival at Ellis Island, up the ladder rung by rung, $5 a week, $10 a week, uh, $100 a week, a mink coat, a better address, from neighborhood trade to an international clientele, from a nobody to a legend. And in fact, there was some truth to that portrait. Uh, Polly's speakeasy with a harem, as she liked to call it, was um, they were more than an oasis of illicit sex. Uh, her Manhattan brothels were also impromptu salons of a certain kind where the lowbrow and the highbrow happily mingled. Um, as Polly put it, from the parlor of my house, I had a backstage three-way view. I could look into the underworld, the half world, and the high. Um, slumming intellectuals, uh, Broadway bohemians, journalists were amused by her blunt realism and her witty wisecracks. Uh, many in the underground gay community in New York, uh, both male and female, found her parlor to be a place that they could relax and let their hair down and be themselves. Executives in the new fields of radio and motion pictures and uh, advertising used her girls uh, to woo clients. Wall Street traders, Packed al passed along stock tips on their way to the bedroom. Racketeers used her parlor as a place where they could uh, sort of informal headquarters where they could confer with politicians and judges away from the prying eye of the public. Uh, entertainers uh, knew that they had hit the big time when they could afford uh, an evening with her girls. Crooked cops made her place their home away from home. And everyone, from Park Avenue aristocrats to Lower East Side hooligans appreciated her ironclad discretion. Now, no one meeting Polly Adler on the street would have uh, taken her for a fallen woman. As one journalist said, uh, she one would have, one would, she was homey, was how this journalist describes her. One would have placed her, however mistakenly, as the ubiquitous mama in a family run delicatessen. Uh, she was tiny, like many of the immigrants of that era. She was barely five feet tall in her highest heels. She had a, a cute little Cupid doll face. 
her jewelry uh, was a tad showy and she had a weakness for mink coats, uh, but no more than any ambitious Manhattan gold digger. In fact, Polly was raised to be a good Jewish girl and to the end of her life, that is how she saw herself, even if it was um, an unorthodox way of looking at it. Um, Pearl, as her parents called her, was born in 1900, uh, more or less. She, they were never quite sure what her, her actual birthday was. Uh, she was born in a small town, a shtetl in the Pale of Russia in what is now Belarus. She was an unusually clever and self-possessed child. Um, I read, uh, she reminded me a great deal of the stories of Shalom Alechem, uh, who was the source material for the great musical Fiddler on the Roof. She was of that generation of daughters uh, young daughters who were eager to shake off the confines of village life uh, to see the world, uh, to make something of themselves. In Yiddish, uh, using the older sense of the word, we would have said that she aspired to be a mensch, uh, that is a person of substance and respect, a, a somebody with a capital S. Uh, her family uh, supported her ambitions, which was very unusual for a girl in this era. But as the old Yiddish saying goes, Man plans and God laughs. Uh, Polly was 13 when her, fa her father decides that the family should uh, move to the golden land of America. But resettling such a large family uh, was too expensive to do all at once. So he decides they're going, he's going to send them uh, one by one in installments, as she put it. And she, as the oldest child, is the first to go. She lands on Ellis Island in December of 1913 when she is about 13 years old. She's sent to stay with friends of her father in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, they were landsmen, uh, uh, but they were not really people that she knew at all. And then tragedy strikes. Before her parents could immigrate, World War I breaks out, cutting off all travel from Russia and leaving Polly stranded among strangers. She's forced to quit and school and take a job in one of Springfield's paper factories, where she made a, three, a mere $3 a week, working nine hour days. Um, she's miserable, she's poor, uh, she's lonely. So when she, is 15, she decides she's gonna go try her luck in Brooklyn, New York, where she has some cousins. Now she gets to Brooklyn. She doesn't have much money. She doesn't have the education she wanted. She doesn't really have a lot of home life, but what she has is freedom. Um, she gets a job in a garment factory and she throws herself into the thrills of life after work, uh, into the Brooklyn dance halls, um, in the, the thrills of Coney Island uh, and the promenade of Pitkin Avenue. Uh, she did not realize it at this point, but this was the big turning point of her life. Now, there's a wise guy question. I'm sure you have all heard this. Uh, it's usually uttered as a kind of slightly lecherous joke, uh, but certainly any woman who works in the sex trades has heard it. Uh, it, it, it is the question, the age old question, uh, what is a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? Polly hated that question. Uh, she figured, well, frankly, it was none of their damn business, <laughs> what she usually said. Uh, but, and in fact, she was always very um, cagey about exactly how she went from being a good Jewish girl uh, to being uh, a woman in the sex trades. Uh, she tried, she does say a little bit about it. Um, you know, there, there were traumas along the way. Um, she was 17 and when she was raped by her boss at the, at the corset making factory, she got pregnant when her boss refused to marry her. Uh, she goes uh, and gets an illegal abortion, which I did not realize would be as, as timely a question when I was writing the book. Um, she loses her job. She gets kicked out of the house by her cousins. I, Nonetheless, I think it is hard to understand how a 19-year-old girl decides to go into the sex trades if you've never really experienced that kind of poverty and loneliness, those feelings of powerlessness and helplessness. So she starts to feel like so many women, young women in her position, that selling sex is going to be the path to a glamorous new life. She's going to have cash and pretty clothes and camaraderie. It starts to seem to her like a sign of smarts, a badge of honesty, maybe even a badge 
of honor in a world that clearly doesn't care what happens to her. She opens her first brothel in 1920 in uh, a two-room apartment uh, right across from Columbia University, which is an all-male university at that point. In fact, it's right where Butler Library is now. This is the same year that Prohibition takes effect. Uh, obviously, it turned out to be a good uh, decision uh, where to place her new her new shop, um, her new brothel, uh, because uh, she decides you know she's just going to make enough money until she can uh, quit and get a legitimate job. And uh, you know she wants to open a dress shop, which is a very common ambition for many uh, Jewish women. And in fact, it doesn't take very long before she does. It only takes two years. Now you have to remember. Uh, so she, two years after two years, she saved enough money. She opens a, 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 a dress shop on the Upper West Side, but it doesn't take very long for her to sour on legitimate business. She had quite frankly become addicted to the high profit margins that prostitution offered. And an era where the average man makes about $3,000 a year, the average white man and the average white woman makes about half of that she is very quickly pulling down $60,000 annually, uh, which is the equivalent of about a million bucks in today's money. And even more important to her, it's the first time she has power over her circumstances. So in 1923, she goes back into the flesh trade and in a fateful turn, she is taken up by the notorious gambler and political fixer, a guy who you may have heard of uh, named Arnold Rothstein. Um, Arnold Rothstein, uh, if you're a sports fan, uh, is infamous as the gambler who uh, tried to fix the 1919 World Series, the Black Sox World Series. If you are a musical theater fan, uh, Rothstein's floating crap games inspired the Broadway musical Guys and Dolls. Um, he is, uh, Arnold Rothstein is uh, the biggest, he is the king of the underworld at this point. And he introduces her to all the up and coming bootleggers, all the rising big shots like Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Legs Diamond. Polly's house soon becomes the favorite hotspot uh, after hours for the big time bookies and bootleggers who are so eager to splurge and, sh and uh, spend their ill-gotten gains. Now, all of this makes Polly more ambitious. I had always told my girls, if you have to be a prostitute, be a good one, said Polly. Well, the same applied to me. If I have to be a madam, then I will be a good madam. And now she declares she is determined to be, as she puts it, the best goddamn madam in all of America. Now, she can't advertise like legitimate business, so she has to master alternative forms of publicity. She begins parading uh, through the high-end speakeasies and nightclubs with a posse of her best-looking girls as a way to show off her wares. She talks about this, that actually men will go and follow her and her girls from speakeasy or nightclub to nightclub and actually sometimes follow her them home to her brothel. So it's clearly a very effective form of advertising. Um, she also uh, begins cultivating gossip columnists and journalists like uh, Walter Winchell, who you may remember the name, who was the most read columnist in, in America for 20, 30 years. Uh, he becomes one of her steadiest clients. Now, these journalists, they don't put her name in print, but they spread her name far and wide through word of mouth. And it works. She becomes a little like the Forrest Gump of the Roaring Twenties. She turns up in all kinds of cultural hotspots. Uh, she becomes deeply involved in the world show business in uh, Tin Pan Alley. She counts stars like Duke Ellington and Milton Berle, Fats Waller, Desi Arnaz, uh, George Gershwin, John Garfield, dozens of Hollywood uh, screenwriters, producers, and directors among her biggest clients uh, and among her friends, actually. She entertains many of the great athletes of this golden age of sports, uh, including uh, she is the favorite hostess of the Yankee Stadium and Madison Square Garden crowds, including uh, the great Jack Dempsey and uh, Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio, though, complains, I'm sorry, this is going to be the first of many vulgar things that I'm going to say, uh, that uh, Joe DiMaggio complains that he does not like her silk sheets because uh, her his knees keep slipping. So as ever the good hostess she sends out and brings him cotton sheets just for Jolton Joe. Um, 
her brothel becomes the clubhouse, the kind of late night clubhouse for the writers, actors, and playwrights who gather at the Algonquin Hotel for lunch, um, the famous Algonquin Round Table. They are really what we would now call the cultural influences cultural influencers of the day, uh, people like Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley and George Kaufman, their stamp of approval brings the big money men in Madison Avenue, Park Avenue, and Wall Street. She soon is counting uh, real, honest-to-God American aristocrats uh, as her friends and clients, people like Jock Whitney or Winthrop Rockefeller or the Vanderbilt Boys, as she calls them. But the bread and butter of her business is conventions and business meetings, which I think may well still be how uh, this business works. This is a time when Midtown Manhattan was the center of what was called the flourishing party girl racket. Um, they cater to the expense account men who rely on easy women to grease the wheels of commerce. Polly quickly becomes the leading provider of professional party girls uh, in New York. Back then, uh, salesmen and account executives are all expected to have what they called, um, well, they call it a stud book, uh, what we would probably refer to as a little black book um, that has all filled with phone numbers of girls that are considered uh, good sports is the phrase they always use. Uh, what I think they really mean is amateur nymphomaniacs. Um, and it turns out there are never enough amateur nymphomaniacs to, uh, to entertain all of New York's businessmen. Uh, so after an evening of drinking with potential clients, someone will inevitably suggest, hey, what about some women? Uh, this is how the ad man turned novelist Sherwood Anderson puts it. So a few phone calls later, they would find themselves partying in someone's apartment with the money exchanged so discreetly or on credit that many of the girls might not even, they might not even realize that the girls are getting paid. I, a more modern, I spent a lot of time trying to picture how this might work. And I finally realized the more modern version uh, is made the way people still go to strip clubs nowadays to bond. Um, the psychologists call this the power of shared transgression. Uh, that is rebelling against the rules, indulging in forbidden delights together and getting away with it, uh, can create an instant camaraderie, uh, a delicious feeling of secret power. As one auto industry salesman explained bluntly, you get a bunch of guys together in a room who don't know each other, you get drunk and you look at naked women together and the next day, you're great friends. Uh, sometimes this bond is laced with something more sinister. Uh, as one CEO explains, the point is that I know the buyer has spent a night with a prostitute that I've provided. In most cases, the buyers are married uh, with families. It sort of uh, gives me an edge. I, I'll not exactly call it blackmail, but it gives me a substantial edge, a subconscious edge over the buyer. It is a weapon that I hold. Arnold Rothstein, also introduces Polly to an army of crooked police and politicians. She becomes known for her generous bribes to the vice squad uh, and her wild parties where gangsters mingled with politicians and judges. Um, New York's famous playboy mayor, uh, Jimmy Walker, was one of her most valued customers. Uh, one critic summed up the case against Polly this way. Uh, she provided a liaison between under, the underworld politics, the professions, big business, and desirable women. Judges' tips were bartered in her plush parlor. Racketeer bosses uh, and racketeers and labor bosses formulated deals there. Police officers were broken or made, and candidates for public office gained or lost party support as a result of conferences held in Polly's place. So now here I'm going to stop um, and I'm going to warn you that we've come to what I consider to be the most controversial point in Polly's story. So over the years, Polly would come to count some of the most powerful men in America among her customers, precisely because she kept their secrets. But near the end of her life, when her health is beginning to fail, uh, her mind is brooding, brooding, brooding on the past. Um, she makes a shocking confession. Uh, she get, tells it to this, uh, he at the time, he's a young man. Uh, when I interviewed him, he was in his late 80s. Um, so according to this now elderly friend, Polly confessed that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had been one of her clients around the time that he was running for governor of New York. 
She didn't explain much about it, except to say that she was being, being taken care of for the rest of her life by the contributions of Democrats. Now, you can imagine how surprised I was by this story. I, hadn't, I knew plenty of her uh, political contacts, but I had never heard anything about FDR, one of uh, America's most beloved presidents, uh, St. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, to many people. And I spent many, 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 many hours looking into this. It probably added a whole year onto the book, trying to figure out uh, if it was possible to confirm this claim. Um, and I never really could definitively. However, I did find many uh, circumstantial connections between Polly and Roosevelt. Uh, it was well known that FDR loved an old fashioned stag party uh, and he threw one every year for his birthday, a men's only bash with all of the trimmings, uh, even when he was in the White House. Uh, and despite his illness, his paralysis, Roosevelt was apparently capable of enjoying sex, uh, even without, uh, with women who were not his wife, as we now know. Um, the eminently respectable newspaper publisher, Dorothy Schiff, recounted a conversation with Roosevelt's doctor about whether, and this is how she puts it, whether the president is still potent. Uh, obviously, this is before HIPAA laws, because he had no problem saying, replying and saying, oh, yes, says the doctors, don't, said the doctor, don't forget, only his legs are paralyzed. So Dorothy Schiff is, she says, sort of, sort of naively, I would guess. She says, uh, oh dear, I just see the question that just popped up in the, in the chat box. Oh, oh, okay, now. Uh, <laughs> this is, obviously this group is a little more broad-minded than I might've guessed. Uh, so she says, don't forget only his legs are paralyzed. Uh, and she says, well, well, how does he do it? Uh, and the doctor replies uh, using a, a coded language, um, the French way. Now, um, please pardon me again. I hope you are broad-minded because this is, uh, this is where a place you might get offended. What the French way means essentially is oral sex, uh, fellatio, which is to say a specialty that was only, pro uh, only practiced by prostitutes back in those days. So I want to pause again. Um, this sordid story is a good reminder that, as Polly would be the first to say, being a madam is not a glamorous career. No matter how much money or power or celebrity is involved, prostitution is a physically and mentally demanding business. Alcoholism, drug addiction, physical abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, suicide, they are all common occupational hazards. Uh, for 25 years, 25 years, Polly is always looking over her shoulder for cops, undercover investigators, blackmailers, sociopathic customers, when she would think of all the bribes that she had to pay to double-crossing cops, all the beatings she took from coked up gangsters, um, and probably worst of all is the hypocrisy of her so-called respectable customers. It, sometimes it really just made her blood boil. But that was the secret to her success, her ability to take it on the chin without squawking and then get back up with a smile on her face. To an outsider, she once quipped, it might seem that I've got Polly Adler confused with Pollyanna. Well, I can only say that I am one of those people who just can't help getting a kick out of life, even when it's a kick in the teeth. So this Pollyanna attitude though is put to the test in the 1930s. When the depression sets in, the economic crash comes, the national mood uh, turns on a dime. Suddenly all those crooked politicians, all those so-called glamorous mobsters, they don't seem, uh, their shenanigans do not seem so harmless. Polly's underworld, poly, underworld power brokers are being targeted now by powerful federal and state investigations. Whether or not Governor Roosevelt was a client of Polly's, she was very much on his radar as he was preparing to run for president in 1932. So now Polly's hard-won notoriety is a liability. She gets swept up in the nets of all these uh, investigations. And by 1931, the newspaper, she is now on the cover of all the newspapers. It is no longer a secret career. The newspapers are calling her the female Al Capone and the first lady of the underworld. When the pressure grows too hot, she goes on the lam to Miami and Havana, which are big gangster hideaways at this time. 
Polly, however, is wily enough to come through the crisis relatively unscathed, unlike many of her political friends. Uh, and to her surprise, when the storm finally passes in 1932, she discovers that her new tabloid celebrity has only boosted her reputation among the sophisticates of cafe society. She is powerful enough and wily enough to escape prison until 1935 when she's swept up in the hunt for Dutch Schultz, who has, uh, you may know the name, a very famous uh, Jewish gangster who has been using her brothels as uh, hideaways uh, during uh, when he's been on the lam from the law. Her trial in 1935 causes another media frenzy. But through the aid uh, of her friend, Lucky Luciano, in the end, she is sentenced to only one month in prison and she even gets five days off for good behavior. Uh, when she gets out of jail, for the first time, she's really thinking seriously about quitting the business and for good reason. Uh, it's been nearly two decades now and her pride and her nerves are completely shot. Uh, she's paranoid also for good reason. Uh, she's well aware that J. Edgar Hoover has personally directed the FBI to find something on her uh, and that Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia is determined to drive her out of New York. However, even when she rebuilds her savings and she has enough money that she could easily retire, she hesitates. She had seen enough of human hypocrisy to know that uh, when she was uh, in the square world, she would be just another nobody or maybe even worse. Or as she puts it, as Miss Pearl Adler, the reformed procuress and honest citizen, I was a social outcast. As Madame Polly, the proprietress of New York's most opulent bordello, society came to me. Oh, have I lost you? Nope, there we are. So, you know, it, it, she finally decides it, she 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 stays uh, she stays in business all the way through World War II, through the Fat Cat years of World War in, up until about 1945, when she finally decides no, she she's ready. She's ready to find an exit plan. Uh, so she begins to think about retiring. Back in eight, back in 1930. Abe Lastfogel, uh, the famous boy genius of the legendary William Morris Agency, had urged her to write a memoir. But at the time, nothing could have been less appetizing. The tabloids would have paid a pretty penny for it, but that would have just about covered the cost of her funeral. But as the years go on, the idea of becoming an author, like so many of her friends, appeals more and more to her. Dozens of, of you know, mugs, no smarter than she has, no more education than she has, have turned stories of gangsters and gold diggers into best-selling books and hit movies. Why shouldn't she? So in 1945, she closes up her house in Manhattan and moves to Los Angeles, California, where so many of her old pals have now moved. Uh, it's a very common story in American history from Russia to New York to, to Los Angeles. Um, she goes back to high school. She gets her high school degree. She, gets, she enrolls in junior college and gets her associate's degree. And finally, after seven years and scores of rejections by prudish publishers, in 1953, she publishes her memoir, A House is Not a Home. This book is an instant bestseller. It goes on to sell 2 million copies. The, the story is, it's a great book. Um, it's how I first discovered her. Um, it's, it's whitewashed, of course. She cannot tell everything she knows, but, this backstairs chronicle of the early sexual revolution and the secret role uh, that illicit sex played in business and politics, it was a huge eye opener for millions of Americans. Polly gives the age of conformity, as we like to call the 1950s, a shocking jolt on par with her fellow authors of 1953, Alfred Kinsey, Simone de Beauvoir, and Hugh Hefner. Um, as it happens, she became very good friends with Dr. Kinsey, and she both read and approved heartily of both sexual behavior in the American female, the second Kinsey report, and uh, de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. Unfortunately, try as I might, I could find no comment uh, that she left on the newly founded Playboy magazine. Probably didn't know how big that was gonna be. She was not without regrets, but when pressed, she was unrepentant. 
1961, she sells the film rights to A House Is Not A Home to a Hollywood producer. Unfortunately, she did not live uh, long enough to enjoy the delicious irony of seeing Joan Crawford, Barbara Stanwyck, Ethel Merman, and her good friend Martha Ray all scrapping to play Manhattan's number one madam on the silver screen. Of all the things she accomplished in her life, I guarantee you this is the one she probably would have liked the most. Um, in the end, the role goes to Shelley Winters. You might remember uh, her. She is a 40-something at the time blonde actress. Uh, she had won a, an Oscar at that point and had played prostitutes actually in the past. Um, you can see the movie. It's called A House and Not a Home after the book. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can watch it for free, but uh, that's about all it's worth. It is is really not a good movie uh, at all. <laughs> I would, it got terrible reviews, um, but it had a few things uh, that uh, going for it. Uh, the costume designer of uh, the very famous Edith Head was nominated for an Oscar. Um, the title song uh, by Burt Bacharach becomes a top 100 hit sung by Dionne Warwick. Uh, and the young actress Raquel Welch made her acting debut uh, in the movie uh, as one of Polly's stable of girls. When Polly dies in, of lung cancer in June of 1962, long, respectful obituaries run in every paper across the country. I, it was remarkable, remarkable to me. I, I could not find a paper where her, her uh, obituary doesn't run. Uh, they are hailing her as a symbol of a decadent and long gone era. To her admirers, her brothel was an intoxicating playground for those madcap modernists, for those cutting edge capitalists, all in hot pursuit of new pleasures. Um, they were a space where the imagination was allowed free play, unfettered by outside eyes and conventional rules. In turn, her customers and even some of her employees turned these illicit experiences uh, into fodder for the songs, movies, books, plays, and all the daring new notions that would define 20th century popular culture. To her foes, however, Polly exerted a sinister influence with powerful men whose after dark decision making affected millions of Americans. If we believe her claim that she procured women for FDR, and that her discretion was critical to his election to the presidency, then her significance was even greater than her critics feared. Publishing a best-selling book, of course, boosted her legacy. As one journalist observed, after all of Polly's corruption of both men and women, when she finally cashed in her chips, what did the obituaries read? Of course, author dies. Uh, of course, you know, while I was reading, working on this book, uh, I reread and reread and thought a lot about The Great Gatsby, that, that great novel of the American jazz age. Unfortunately, if Polly ever met F. Scott Fitzgerald or read The Great Gatsby, she left no record of it. But I am quite certain she would have found Gatsby's romance with Daisy a little hard to swallow, a little hard to believe. Reverence towards women was not a common trait among the men, uh, the bootleggers that she knew. Uh, and undoubtedly, she had had some very practical questions about how Gatsby handled the mechanics of throwing a massive house party every weekend. How did he handle all those dirty dishes, all that soiled linen? Uh, but, but the struggles of Jimmy Gatz as he transformed himself into Jay Gatsby, his, his heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as Fitzgerald puts it, that would have been hauntingly familiar to her. When Fitzgerald began his novel in 1923, he drew his inspiration from several of Polly's actual friends, uh, who were ga gangster friends. Very specifically, he drew his inspiration from a chance meeting with Arnold Rothstein, who he recounts, uh, recasts, excuse me, as the uh, character Meyer Wolfsheim in the book. But oddly, after all that, it is Polly who brings to life Fitzgerald's fantasy of the wild party as the glorious vehicle for pursuing the American dream. Like Gatsby, she turns this uh, jazz age cult of the party into a ladder to climb out of the gutter and into the upper rungs of society. And yet, despite her passionate pursuit of posterity, it is not Polly, but her male criminal colleagues who become 20th century cultural icons. 
Prohibition enshrines the gangster as an American archetype whose lordly ambitions and tragic flaws are considered essential to understanding our national character. Many of these people, many of her friends, men like Meyer Lansky or Dutch Schultz, Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel, they have become legends. Anyone who has watched all three of the, uh, of the uh, Godfather movies knows how central these figures are to how we think about ourselves as Americans. And yet, oddly, there is no corresponding myth of the female outlaw who uses sex as her weapon against the world. Uh, it never, the Scarlet Woman is Horatio Alger tale, as one scholar puts it, it has never grabbed the American imagination the way the Rum Runners and the Racketeers did. I, so when I was ending the book, that was the question that kept haunting me. Why not? Uh, it's, it's not because the lives of women like Polly are unrecorded or uninteresting. Scholars estimate that there are well over a billion pages that have been published about prostitutes, covering every possible angle. I finally came to conclude that I think it is because Polly's version of the story exposes the dark reality. Uh, behind the gauzy dreams. In particular, she reveals how often all those freewheeling flappers and those cafe society glamour girls were really sad young women being paid to provide other people's pleasure. Sex workers in general, and Polly in particular, are dealers in illusion, the illusion of intimate connection between strangers, of desires without limits or consequences, of spontaneous ecstasy on command, or whatever else the human id can dream up and pay for. Polly's mastery of this mysterious art was the source of her significance, and it contributed in no small part to the glorious legend of the Jazz Age. But Americans have little appetite for examining the dreary mechanics behind the spectacle of our dreams. For that reason, Despite her quest for fame, Polly hid far more of her story than she shared, even from herself. If Polly has not received her historical due, I think it's in part because she is a symbol whose reality contradicts the very myths that make this era so captivating. And that, as she herself would be the first to say, is a very hard sell. But all this may be changing. Anyone who reads the daily papers, uh, reads about Jeffrey Epstein or Harvey Weinstein or Prince Andrew, for heaven's sakes, Andrew Cuomo, we, I, the name, the list could go on and on. Anyone who follows the Me Too movement knows that we are in the midst of a new cultural moment where we are much more interested in exposing the intersections of sex and power and dismantling the silence that protects powerful people from bearing the full cost of their desires. Maybe now, if I might be allowed to say in closing, if I can quote Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, maybe now Polly is finally ready for her close up. Well, thank you. Um, I, 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 I'm in a new space. I, I hear the heating going on. I hope that that was not distracting for you because uh, uh, clearly I'm not actually in 1920s New York um, in my basement. Uh, but uh, if you have, quite, thank you for having me. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, I can answer. I do not know whether or not uh, FDR used silk sheets. That uh, I, 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 that is nobody has ever asked me that one before. <laughs> Judy, I'm proud of you for coming up with that question, although it doesn't <laughs> surprise me in the slightest. Um, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand with the raise hand icon. You can make a note in the chat box, or you can just like raise your hand. Um, I'm going to go first to Marsha and Mark. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I hope you'll indulge me for a moment because I've been reading your book. Oh. And I'm only up to 1935, but it is. It is I know. <laughs> it's long. I, I know. I'm sorry. It's heavy, too. It's heavy. Yeah, but it's but it's very good. It's a remarkable book, I have to tell you. Um, that, that it's so much more than a biography of Polly Adler. You've written a, a, an in-depth social history of the 20s and 30s, prime, at least up to what I'm up to, um, but from a whole different viewpoint than one normally reads this. So it's it's amazing. I mean, I started to read it and I thought, you know, I, I read the Shtetl chapter at the beginning and I was hooked from there because that alone was, was an amazing take on 
life back then and there. Um, and you've done a, you know, very vivid view of the double standard that you've, you've talked about here too, yeah. that, that how normal it was for respectable yeah. married men. Of course, they're going to go to brothels all the time. And I, I, there were many shocking things and what, and I still could never get my head around just how common it was that, you know, prostitution was uh, this is before the sexual revolution and just Sexual harassment, there is no word for sexual harassment. The amount of sexual harassment going on is just mind blowing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, also you're, you're um, using the, the language that you, you put in there, the adding in all the vernacular of the time. And that was fascinating as well. And I found myself, you know, writing down all the addresses because now <laughs> I want to look around and look at that apartment building. And I wonder if they're still, so anyway. The only thing was Harpo, Harpo, really? <laughs> now, yes, so she, she became very friends with the Marx brothers. The, the Marx brothers were, were not exactly angels. Well, no, uh, even no, Harpo, I, I, even Harpo. Uh, you know, one, that's one of the things that's really interesting about this time period is when the 1920s begin, if you're in show business, you might as well be like a pickpocket in terms of respectability. That that is, it is just not a respectable field to be in. Uh, you would not want your daughter to go onto the stage. Um, and that really changes over the course of the 20s and 30s. And of course, money changes. There's much more money to be had than the movies make uh, the, them stars. But a lot of those people, they were not very educated. They, 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 they're traveling around in the vaudeville circuit. And one of the only places a lot of them were welcome was to stay in brothels. You would go to a new town and you know that's, that's the only place anyone would let you go. Anyway, I really do have two quick questions. Anyway, um, one, do you do you think her path, the way you've written it, it feels like her path to where she wound up was kind of inevitable, um, based on all the events of her life leading up to her choosing that direction. And the other one was, um, obviously, you said you started with her autobiography. Um, but I'm curious about your research pro process. I mean, did you check out all these locations in Manhattan and all of that stuff as well. So, um, well, it, it is so to take the first question, was it inevitable? Um, in fact, she herself doesn't say that she has to in, in she when she's writing her memoir, she has to she has to explain to, uh, you know, to a much less sophisticated set of readers than we have now. Right. Because it's the 1950s how it is that it's not just enough to be poor. There are lots of many, many, many more poor girls than there are prostitutes. So there is something that clearly goes on uh, that, that about her being abandoned without, I mean, we make fun of the stereotype of the Jewish mother, but having a Jewish mother there, having somebody saying, no, you're not going out to Coney Island in the middle of the, you know, in the night. No, you're not running around with all those hooligans. Uh, it makes a difference. I mean, having her family, the low and also the loneliness. One of the reasons that people become move into the underworld is because they're, they will be accepted there. Unlike in the upper world where people will look down their nose at them. So she really she really has to try to explain why she did it. And in many ways, she never really does accept that she is ambitious. It's like, why do those guys become bootleggers? They are shut out of um, opportunity as, uh, as, as immigrants. Uh, not every immigrant, but that little generation, there's a lot of them who are shut out of uh, opportunity. And if you have ambition and the world is treating you rotten, well, to hell with the world. Maybe maybe the laws of the goyim are not so important, uh, and I so I I think it's her ambition really that that takes her there, and uh, and somehow and yeah, so it's a good question. No one's ever asked me. Did it feel inevitable? Um, the research, though. Oh my God, I could talk about the research part forever because that's the fun part. That's the detective Sherlock Holmes stuff. That's why it took so long. Um, there were some wonderful things. She really was a pack rat. She had trunk of material that she wanted to save uh, programs and scrapbooks and letters and signed copies of books from her friends. Sadly, many of her family members uh, were very embarrassed 
by uh, her her career. Um, and the last brother who inherited all of everything, her money and all of her trunks, threw away most of it. Mm. Not all of it. I still hold some some not hate in my heart but I have a lot of hard feelings towards that brother to this day um but some of it was saved so I had a little bit of there the um there was um I don't know if you're familiar with the Yiskor memorial books that Yad Vashem created after World War II where they um they gathered together people from all the shtetls that had been destroyed during the war and recorded their memories so that you could recreate for each village or each town um, some some profile, some memories of it. And there was a wonderful Yisker book for her town. It even mentions her dad in it, and it's that was that was extraordinary. Um, that was a true, truly wonderful. The other thing is she had a ghostwriter who helped with her book. Uh, as she said, she had no idea how hard it was going to be to write a book, which I, she said, actually, which I appreciated the most. If she'd known how hard it was uh, to write a book, she probably would have stayed running a brothel, uh, which <laughs> I found much very gratifying. Um, and uh, at one point, this is early on, the internet is not quite the big to do that it is now. Um, and I'm just putting her name in to, to see what pops up. And up pops on a, a bulletin board for antiquarian collectors. Does anyone know what a suitcase full of correspondence and notebooks uh, between this woman named Polly Adler and Virginia Faulkner, the name of her ghostwriter, is worth? To my response was, it's not worth anything to anyone else except me. Please don't get it. Don't give it to anyone else. Uh, and that was hugely helpful. That had a lot of real names. It had some of the addresses. Uh, and then the last big thing is she did after the scandals of the 30s, she becomes famous. She is in the gossip columns all the time. And there are gossip columns of all kinds. Uh, she's in the newspaper. You So that as more and more newspapers came online, uh, there's a wonderful site, if you're at all interested in history and family history, uh, called newspapers.com, where you can put in your, you can find all kinds of things about your your long gone relatives. Uh, and that was a, a gold mine. So that it, I was a little like a drug addict, actually, constantly looking for the next the next thing and uh, something would, uh, that's, uh, that's why the book is so long too, let's face it. <laughs> I love every every bit of it. Thank you, Marsha. I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions? Judy uh, Epstein, I muted you so that. It, okay, thank you. I'm assuming did she that she didn't have any children? Did that abortion render her infertile? I think she, I think quite likely um, that is is super. I, one of the things I spent a lot of time learning about is. Um, sexually transmitted diseases because it was such a fact of life. Uh, and a lot of times if you had an abortion, especially if it was not a great abortion, you know, if it <laughs> didn't go all that well, if you had any kind of infection oh. at all, you're, you're, you would end up infertile. And in fact, it, that was <laughs> another huge shock, just how common abortion was because it, it, birth control is illegal. And, and it's, it, it's harder to get uh, your hands on birth control in many ways than it is to get an abortion. And there are people, perfectly respectable people, uh, housewives, well-to-do people, Hollywood stars who are having multiple abortions just as a way to try to not have 10 kids or people who had 10 kids to not have 15 kids. Uh, but she she loved children. And in fact, one of the things like a lot of madams, she was very sentimental about orphans. And she gave quite a bit of money to Jewish orphanages. Uh, what is sad, though, um, is that sometimes if they found out who was giving the money, they would not take it, which, uh, of course, you know, you can imagine how that felt. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other, other. I have a question, and if anyone, there are also questions in the chat. Oh, when sure. did you start your research? I, I can read them out loud if you'd yeah, like. Okay. When did you start your research, and um, and how did the Me Too movement? You know, you referred to this in your talk already, but how did the Me Too movement like affect or inspire your work in this area? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I started the book in 2007, 2008. So it was well before all of this, uh, all of the Me Too stuff uh, happened. Uh, and it's interesting, I would say, well, I'll say two things. One is the more cynical thing, which is it's really a, a darn shame that the book didn't come out right at the heat of it uh, during uh, during the Weinstein, you know, all of that. Uh, I think I think frankly it would have been I w that would have been better for the book. Uh, I always have good to have a hot topic, but please forgive me for saying it so cynically. Um, I, I, one more year if I just gotten it out a little bit earlier. Um, what one thing that was really notable. Uh, um, Actually, even more notable was when you know we moved from the Me Too uprising to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Just as I was finishing, I was finishing the book in 2020, just as that as we were beginning that odyssey with Black Lives Matter and and the um, all of the critiques of the police. And one of the things that I just could never get over is how corrupt the police are. Now, obviously not every policeman uh, is a bad apple, um, but vice squads, even to this day, um, they have to mingle with criminals. That's their job is to be part, to sort of be a little part of the underworld. And the temptations to corruption are just very high. And back then, cops cops are her uh, her biggest customers they they literally hang out at her house all the time enough and behave so badly that she has to call police headquarters sometimes to call and get somebody to come take the cops out of her out of her brothel because they are just so badly behaved so that when uh, black lives matter was happening and we were starting to have all these debates around policing uh, and accountability. It, I had zero problem uh, understanding what the critique was. I think uh, I think if anything, it's better now than it was. But even still, uh, I I'm, I do not mean to say that uh, insult anyone uh, who is an upstanding police officer. But power is power, and it can it can it can be very corrupting. Um, um, I see uh, that someone, Eileen Oranger asked, uh, can you speak to her relationship with her parents? That is kind of one of the, that's one of the complicated and sad things. She doesn't want to talk about her parents. It, it, what she writes about it, her parents is minimal in the book, in her own book. And she tries very hard. To, she brings over all of her family. She's, she is the moneymaker in the family. She brings them all over. She supports her family 100%, especially her parents. She helps put her brothers through school and set them up in businesses. Um, and her parents, I, I think her father probably knew early on. He, she has a lot of property and stock um, accounts, stock trading accounts so that are in his name. So it's fairly likely that maybe he had some understanding that she was doing something not quite right. He, you know, maybe it wasn't, maybe he didn't know it was prostitution, but he probably knew it was something breaking the law. Her mother, his, her mother, she tries very hard to keep it a total secret from until finally she, it, it bursts out into the open with the scandals. And after that, her mother is crushed, of course. Um, Polly, one of the things I, her cousins told me that what she would do on Fridays, she would go home before the Sabbath and would take off all her fancy clothes and get down on her hands and knees and wash the floor for her mother. And she was very devoted to her. But in the end, they are still, they are still good, good Jews who do not approve. So that FDR anecdote, that moment where uh, this young friend uh, is uh, all of a sudden is told by Polly, you know, I knew Franklin Delano Roosevelt is it's actually happens at a critical moment. She is older. Her she's uh, her book. Her book manuscript has just been rejected by every publisher in New York who says, oh, I know it's going to be a big seller, but we can't have your name on our publishing list. Um, her mother she, so this is how he says it happened. They're driving in a car, he's driving her somewhere and Polly's brooding. She's clearly brooding. And she says, out of the blue, would you introduce me to your mother? And he says, well, uh, yeah, of course I would introduce you to my mother. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't I? And she sort of pauses and she says, well, that's interesting because my own mother 
won't have me to the Seder table, won't have me at the high, ho the holidays table, uh, uh, cause she's too ashamed. And he says, and then she pauses again. She says, I think it's interesting that they'll take my money, but won't have me at the holiday table. And then he says, and there's another long pause as if she's working over something in her mind. And then she says, you know, I knew Franklin D. Roosevelt. And it, he said, it was like, it was almost like she was trying to say, here I am feeling humiliated again by the people who love me most. I knew some of the most important people in the world in the, at the time. And how, and how will I ever get enough respect? Never, never spoke about it again, but it clearly ate away at her, her, her relationships with her parents. Uh, it, that was one of the, the sad, the sad things I thought. Um, I see there's another question, Suzanne Holwitz. Um, how nice of you to thank you for the, thanks for the, thanks for the, thanks for the compliment. Um, well, this isn't a question. This was just nice. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, well, you don't get to see that much. You know what, in some way, the, what I will say is the, the, the underbelly, if you think of Jewish criminals and gangsters and bootleggers, because they did dominate bootlegging. They were absolutely dominated the bootlegging industry until the 1930s. And part of it is they don't want their children to go into crime. They want their children to all become dentists and doctors. And where, But the Italians start to take over. And the Italians in the 1930s start pushing the uh, Jews out. And most of the Jews are happy to be pushed out. But up until the 30s, Jews dominate bootlegging and they dominate drugs, the drug trade and Oddly, um, they are very involved in prostitution in an interesting way. Um, Jews are in the 1920s only 20, they're about 20% of New York's population. And it, best as the authorities could figure, they make up about 20% of uh, New York's prostitutes. They make up 50% of New York's madams though. And I think it's very, very much comes from the Jewish tradition of the balabusta. And, and Polly's mother was a real balabusta. She, she had that ability to, um, a lot, remember back in the old country, uh, men studied the Talmud. They, that's what they were, uh, there was a phrase actually, men, uh, men are learners, women are earners. Women were the ones who ran the businesses, who spoke many languages, who uh, often, you know, dealt with the money, who did the, the account books. Um, they're also at the same time running the house, making sure the cow is milked and the ki chickens are fed and the, and the Sabbath dinner is on the table. And that combination that about that of the, the strong woman who, uh, who is good at business and good at making a home, a comfortable, wel welcoming home, is exactly the right combination of skills to run a brothel. Uh, and so it, uh, it was not surprising. It was surprising to everyone else, unless you actually knew uh, that you, most of her colleagues were Jewish women. Uh, so in some ways, I consider this book not just about the underbelly of Jewish life, the underbelly of the underbelly, because it's from the women's point of view, not even just the gangster's point of view. Um, I see. And then there was another question about her family. Um, yes, she did. She was very close to one of her brothers in particular. Uh, and, and I know her niece. She has a niece. And that is uh, really wonderful, a uh, really wonderful person. I was very grateful to get to know them. Um, I, what sparked my initial interest in Polly, um, I was never going to write another book again after that first book. It was very hard. It takes too long. It's a silly way to make a living. It is no way to make a living, really, if you go, if you actually prorate it hour by hour. Uh, but uh, it went well. I was feeling flattered. I thought, oh, that Pulitzer Prize, maybe I should do another book. And I thought, well, I like I like taking a time machine. That's what I want when I read a history book, like the, the feeling that I'm taking a time machine to someplace else. And I thought, well, if I'm going to take a time machine, where would I want to go? And who wouldn't want to go to Jazz Age New York City? And so I was just walking through the shelves in the Yale Library looking at books. It's just There were a lot of things on Calvin Coolidge. My husband kept saying, write a biography of Calvin Coolidge. Not the same. Not the same at all. Uh, and there was her memoir. It was just this little slim red book. 
And I don't know why I picked it up, I, but I did. I took it home and it is a wonderful book. Uh, it's, not as, it's not as accurate uh, as my book, but it's much shorter. Uh, and, uh, it's, uh, but it's, and it's quite fun. And, th and that was where I, got, I thought, oh, she's like a Forrest Gump character, like I, like I say, like, and boy, you could really tell a big American story that way. Um, somebody's asking about the skyline here. I believe this is 1930 and you can see, well, actually it's a green screen right here, so I can't see, but you can see you're just starting to get the really tall skyscrapers. I think you actually ha can see uh, the Empire State Building, I believe in one of those corners. This big tall building right in the front is the Woolworth uh, the old Woolworth building, which was for many years the, gra the grandest building. Um, the sad part is a lot of the old speakeasy district is being torn down. If you ever go to, um, if you have been to New York City since uh, COVID, they have changed a lot of the zoning laws in Midtown, which for years stayed about the same. Many of her brothels were still there. Um, and now they are tearing down everything to build massive skyscrapers. So if you really want to see what it was like, uh, her world, um, what's the place to go is, you know, in the theater district on the other side of Broadway, where they still have all the little brownstones and the little tiny restaurants. That is exactly what her world uh, looked like uh, with all the, where would you put a speakeasy now in all these big, uh, these big grand skyscrapers? You don't, not so easy uh, to, to jam in an illegal drinking spot. But, um, I don't wanna keep you guys too long because I know this is uh, online, so it's not as easy, but if I, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions as long as you have them. So I, I want to be I want to be sensitive to time. I don't know if there's any last questions. I just wanted to say I think all of us want to spend more time with you, Debbie. Oh, <laughs> we all want to learn. I, we really do. Honestly, I'm like, where can I see you again? Like, where? Else, <laughs> what are you teaching? What? You know, we we want to. We're all going to get your other book too. I'll tell you um, what I'm doing right now is mostly just sitting around watching Netflix and thinking and cleaning the house. I don't, I don't, writing another book. What am I, what am I, stupid? Like, this is <laughs> like, or at the very least, maybe I can write a book this big that, 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 that doesn't, that doesn't, you don't have to practice uh, arm curls to lift. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, I think Marsha, you know, Marsha, of course, said it best. I want to, uh, in terms of how much she, she's, you know, reading your book and how much she loves it. I want to read out loud what you were just, you know, being humble about, which is Suzanne's comment, which is, thank you for an excellent book about that period of time. The intersection of gangsters, politicians, businessmen, entertainers is often an overlooked part of our history. I learned so much from this book and expanded the knowledge I gained from a class I audited on Jews and crime. I think the professor is actually going to add your book to the class he's teaching oh, next semester. Right. So that was a pretty nice comment. And I would... it's no favor to the kids who are like, what, you assigned me this huge book? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, all of us can go chapter by chapter. And I would just say, you know, I normally I would say buy, you know, we want you to buy the book from our local independent bookstore. But unfortunately in Port Washington, our local independent bookstore went out of business last weekend. Oh, um, no. So that means it oh. is no, no. And it's really sad. Oh. Um, but what we do want you to do is, you know, please buy the book. It's called um, Madam, the Biography of Polly Adler icon of the jazz age. And if you can't remember all of that, you can just do a search for Debbie Applegate and Debbie's last, Debbie's first name is um, ends with the Y. Is that what you just said? It, no, uh, yes, thank you. That's very nice of you. I was just going to say, I would go with Polly Adler. You can find her all, all over the place now because she, now that she's back, now that she's back, she she's done quite, you, you, can, you can see quite a bit of her. Uh, the, the one thing I, was, I will say that's worth, um, I'm a big fan of listening to books. Uh, and uh, when I, when they gave, when they gave me the choice of, um, the voices I could have. I made sure to pick somebody who was lively and funny because the book is supposed to be a little funny. But then they called me back and said, hey, can you help us with the Yiddish pronunciations here? And I was like, oh no, I am not going to be responsible for that. Uh, and had to go get an expert. Uh, there's not a lot of Yiddish, but there's enough. She, I think she did her, I think she did her best uh, with that. Although I have heard from other people who have listened to books on tape or they're not on tape, whatever they are now, books 
um, audiobooks where they did not bother to find out how to pronounce the Yiddish words. And apparently you can really murder them uh, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> well, on behalf of Jews everywhere, I say thank you for doing that because indeed I have listened to things where I'm like, really? You couldn't just ask somebody? Didn't, didn't they know anyone who knew how to say it the right way? Right. But, um, and also I want to just say, because you won't say this, but I want to just say, if you when you buy the book, leave a review. Let people know oh, how much you love the book. And if you're someone who used Goodreads, Put a review on Goodreads because, you know, we really appreciate your time, Debbie, and we really love this book and we're also fascinated by it. And this is an important story to get out there. There are so many stories written about men in this world and there's nothing wrong with them. In fact, they're good and important, but also it's so wonderful that you were able to raise up a story about a woman who lived, you know, a very interesting and colorful life. Um, and, and, you know, with a story that, that is important for us to learn about. So, so please make sure you do that friends um make sure you do that and and we did record this and i will be posting the recording so you can share it i mean this was like you had us on the edge of our seat the whole time oh Debbie. thank you and um, uh, i can just tell you can look i mean usually i'm not going to say who it is that i'm related to that falls asleep but you know she was up the whole time so that's, <laughs> that's really you know um this is late for this crowd so um so i'm just saying well thank um, you um so if, if if you have further questions i have a website you'll find you you just can find it it's easy enough to find and there's there's more pictures there also well thank you rabbi um thank, thank you, you to everyone who came and stayed awake and stayed on uh i appreciate it so much and i hope we cross paths again oh, yes one last question movie rights from your mouths to God's ears, uh, let's let's work. Uh, you, let's send out good vibes. Uh, get Netflix on that. So that would be uh, amazing. <laughs> I, I want to just I want to let just just let people know that in two weeks from now, on November sixteenth, we have Mark Arsenal coming. He's the author of The Imposters War. Um, if before you hang up, uh, before you click out, you want to click on the link to register. You can do that. We hope to see you there. Um, Marsha is holding up the book. And we will send out everyone who is here today, we will send out an email to you with um, a link to buy Debbie's book on Amazon and, um, and to her website and, um, and with the recording so that you can share it. Um, okay, everyone, thank you so much for thank coming. Um, thank thanks again, Debbie. And we'll a, see you all again soon. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone.